Welcome to our presentation on the Turbo 9. Uh, this is our master's thesis research fall update, and we will be covering benchmarking and performance. So let's get straight to the point. Last slide first. So our hypothesis is that for specific applications where area and power are a priority, a high performance 16-bit microprocessor is a better solution than a scaled down 32-bit processor. And our conclusion, is that the Turbo 9, which is the microprocessor IP that we have developed, is an open source, compact, high performance, pipeline, 16-bit microprocessor IP delivered in a professional package, making it the superior solution versus other 32-bit solutions in certain applications. So these graphs on the left here show the dry stone benchmark, which we'll go into more detail late, later. The top graph is uh, shown in DMIPS per megahertz, which shows e effectively the efficiency of the process, regardless of process. Uh, so given a certain FPGA or a ASIC, uh, if you divide by the megahertz, you take out the frequency scaling of that, of that platform. And you can look at just the actual logical uh, the design, the microarchitecture, if you will, of that processor and see how, it, how efficient it, it is at processing uh, in this, in this case, uh, running dry stone uh, per megahertz. And obviously here we are beating our competition by a fair margin. Uh, we, are, we are comparing ourselves against the uh, Pico RV32, which is a RISC-V implementation targeting uh, small micro uh, microcontroller um, applications and the Atmel AVR, which we feel would be um, a good uh, com com comparison to the Turbo 9 since it's also a smaller risk that you could argue would be a, uh, a, uh, a good fit for these applications. Also, we're showing the Motorola 6809 because the Turbo 9 uses the same instruction set. Uh, in the graph below, uh, we're showing uh, on, a, on a platform, the, in this case, it's a FPGA. Uh, all these were run at the exact same um, on, on the exact same speed grade FPJ, so it's the exact same process. So now we can take into account frequency, and in this case, versus the uh, RISC V, we are the better solution. So let's dive into the details and results. Okay, this is our supervisory committee. It consists of Dr. Greg Stitt, who is our project chair. Dr. Herman Lamb. Dr. William Eisenstadt and Dr. Eric M. Schwartz. My name is Kevin Philipson, and my project responsibilities are the microarchitecture design and the RTL and microcode development. And I'm Michael Rywalt, and my project responsibilities are the custom microcode macro assembler and verification tools. So we're excited to welcome some new members from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, Boise Pete. Uh, his project responsibilities are porting uh, some of the benchmarks uh, in addition to compiler support and various uh, software tooling support. He will be using our work as a springboard for his PhD. And his uh, advisor is Dr. Martin Margola. So let's talk about why the Turbo 9 is the right tool for the job. So when you're talking about 32-bit uh, or 64-bit CPUs, they're usually used for application processors and they have a large die area um, and a large external memory. So on the right here, we have an example of a SOC and you have a large ARM processor, right? So this is a large, you know, multi-core processor. Um, and then you have a lot of other sub blocks, right? So you have a network interface, an audio interface, USB, video, DSP, and other various de decoders and other sub blocks on this SOC. So what we're what we're uh, saying is that for these sub blocks or for a mixed signal uh, ASIC, a 8-bit or 16-bit CPU uh, can be a better solution given that they have less uh, die area and uh, they require less memory. Therefore, you could use uh, in internal memory. And this could be to do such tasks as, you know, design for test circuitry. Um, you could help out on ATE. You could reload different uh, different programs in for, for a self-test. Uh, it could be for high-level control of the analog or DSP blocks. So if you're in a mixed signal uh, ASIC, um, you could be, you know, doing some kind of, kind of uh, gain, gain control or feedback loop. Um, 
and or could you just be to manage a interface such as spy usb or a network in interface so again the bottom line is you know if the task only requires 16-bit precision a 32-bit risk cpu is a waste of area and power you know the the whole industry is getting you know very excited about risk five you know and, and uh then that's a 32-bit or 64-bit pr uh, platform but you know you can't apply that to every single application and so our uh, our point is that there is a demand for a compact and high performance 16-bit CPU with efficient memory utilization. So let's look at our competitors. Um, so we have four architectures that were included in this presentation: uh, the Turbo 9, the Motorola 6809, and the uh, AVR and the Pico RV32 that I talked about earlier. And then we're also going to include so the uh, IBEX core from Low Risk and the ARM Cortex M0 in the, in the, in the future, but not in this uh, presentation. Uh, so why are these uh, included? Well, obviously the Turbo 9 is the microprocessor IP that we are developing that we think is the correct solution. The Motorola 6809 is the original implement implementation of the instruction set that the Turbo 9 uh, executes. Uh, the AVR is a comparable risk solution that we think is, is, could, could fit the, the same niche as the, as the Turbo 9. And then the Pico RV32 is a size optimized risk five implementation that targets uh, micro microcontroller uh, solutions. The ARM Cortex M0 is the dominant commercial 32-bit solution, and the IBEX core is included here because it's a very uh, much a comparable solution that is open source. Um, I just want to kind of run through some of this stuff quickly, but the instruction set of the Turbo 9 is um, is is considered CISC. That's a retroactive definition. Um, so technically it would be considered sys, but I, I would consider it a, a cumulative ar ar architecture. It's a very tight, very small, efficient, uh, instruction set, uh, that has a lot of different, uh, powerful address, addressing modes and is very or orthogonal and would be ideal for this, uh, for this, um, application. Obviously the rest of these are, are, are various types of risk instruction sets. As far as the instruction size, um, the Turbo 9, Instructions are variable length. Uh, they're they're highly encoded by the very nature, so they, you don't need any kind of com compressed or thumb instruction set here. Um, so this should result in uh, smaller code size. The uh, the other architectures are are fisc fixed length risk, and some of them do offer a uh, compressed option. Uh, so the main points here is um, what is the max. So let's look at what the max operand size is here. So earlier I mentioned that if you have a 16-bit problem, something that only requires 16-bit precision, then why are you using a 32-bit microprocessor? It's just a waste of area and power. So that's kind of our hypothesis, right? Because um, you'll get the same performance out of a 16-bit architecture. So obviously the, the first three can handle 16-bit operands as their largest operand, and the last three are 32-bit operands. Um, and then... Now that's the instruction size, right? So that's the, the operand has to do with the instruction uh, definition. Uh, but as far as the microarchitecture, the hardware that actually executes those instructions, um, the original 6809 was an 8-bit mi microarchitecture. So it had 16-bit instructions, but its hardware was 8-bit and it was multi-cycle. So that means it took multiple cycles to execute one instruction. The Turbo 9 <clears throat> is now a 16-bit microarchitecture internally. And its pipeline, which means that it can overlap uh, instructions and it can reduce that cycle count down to one in some cases. And then the rest of these architectures are various types of pipelined uh, ar architectures. <clears throat> now, the uh, memory architecture and bandwidth. The main, the main thing I want to get across here is the memory bandwidth, right? So if you're a Harvard architecture, you need to add together the program bus and the data bus to get your total number of bits for memory bandwidth. So every single clock cycle, you can you can move this much uh, memory. And that's uh, a, a metric that is that is a big factor in CPU per performance, okay? So the Turbo 9 has a 16-bit memory bandwidth, which is gonna be a surprise to some people. Um, the original Mo Motorola has an 8-bit memory bandwidth and uh, all these other ones, you know, the AVR is 24 and, and the others are either 32 or 64. We've done some preliminary area and uh, power estimate. Um, don't want to go into too much detail, but we will be uh, implementing all these cores in standard cell library, and that will give us a fair playing field to give some uh, much more accurate numbers. 
but my preliminary uh, data tells me that the first uh, four cores are going to be about 1x uh, area and power, and the last two are about 3x. As far as performance is concerned, obviously, we've already shown that the Turbo 9 is faster uh, on in, a dry, in the dry stone benchmark uh, DMEPS per megahertz, uh, about 0.7, uh, so it's faster than the first four, four cores. And then these last two, this is something that we're going to show in the future because there's more to come for the Tur Turbo 9. There's more optimizations that we are, are going to be making, and we think that we'll start approaching the performance of the ARM Cortex-M0. Maybe not beat it, but again, our, our, main, our main goal here, you know, what's important is uh, area and power. And achieving a performance let level uh, would be nice if, if, if we can beat the, beat the ARM or get close to it. That's only a, a, a bonus. And then as far as open source, the, the Turbo 9 is open source. Um, the, the rest of these products are, have, uh, generally have open source uh, IP or clones available with the ARM being the uh, dominant commercial soft IP solution. All right, so let's go over the microarchitecture. Uh, we've looked at this before in previous videos, uh, but this is just going to be a quick overview. Uh, obviously, the Turbo 9 is a pipeline architecture with a fetch stage, a decode stage, and an execute stage. Uh, but also, there's a, a pipelined um, external memory subsystem. In this case, we use the Wishbone Pipeline Protocol, which is an industry standard. Um, as drawn here, we have six pipeline stages, but that can vary. And one thing to point out here is that Internal to the Turbo 9, we have a, uh, a Harvard architecture. We have a data bus going to the execute stage and a program da data bus going to the fetch stage. But externally, we are von Neumann and have a shared program and, da and data bus. Here's a more detailed look at the microarchitecture. And on the left here, we have the fetch stage. Uh, we have an 8-byte instruction queue, which is it's, it's not a cache, but it does have some similar prop, prop properties. Um, and what's happening here is that when the uh, data bus on this side, like it has priority, right? So if the execute stage needs to read or write, it's always going to have priority. But when the when the bus is free, the program bus is just going to be loading as many uh, it, uh, bytes as possible into this uh, instruction queue. And by doing that, when the next in, in instruction is ready to be executed, executed if, if it's ready in the instruction queue it can just proceed to the decode stage uh, there's a little bit more details here there's a there's a pending transaction and and flush lot logic and what that does is just it just keeps track of of how many requests are out on, on the bus because this, this this is a this is a pipeline system so you could have transactions out here and if you need to flush you need to remember how many tra transactions you have out in the um, in the memory subsystem so that when you flush you you flush not only the FIFO but also those those pending transactions and the last thing to note here is that the FIFO itself is used as the pipeline register. Now, the decode stage um, is quite unique in our, our architecture. Um, so it translates the 6009 instructions into RISC microops. Uh, this is similar to what you know Intel and, and AMD do with the um, with the x86 architectures, they basically take the the the, the CISC instructions and they translate them into RISC microops, which they then issue to multiple uh, execute pipelines. Um, so, to, in in in, it, in order to do this, uh, Mike wrote a custom microcode assembler that generates 16 uh, Ver Verilog blocks that are synthesized into gates. So, I want to stress that this is not you know, the old school microprogramming where, you know, you have a ROM that, and it, sequence, it sequences through the, through the ROM in order to execute one instruction. This is very much done in parallel. So the micro assembler basically takes the, the, the microcode that I write and it, 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 it generates these Verilog blocks that will decode informa information directly off the opcode. Um, and from that, our decode stage can Build these uh, micro ops and uh, and execute these uh, instructions very efficiently. Um, and we think it's publication worthy, uh, and we will be pursuing that. And you can go back to the previous videos to get more more details on how that works. Um, the execute stage uh, it's has a 16-bit data ALU and it also has a 16-bit address ALU. Now this is obviously because the instruction set has 16-bit um, instructions. So if you make a 16-bit data ALU, uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of those 16-bit instructions and execute them faster. 
Uh, this 16-bit address LU is in parallel, and uh, for those that know the 6809, uh, know that it has some extremely powerful indexing uh, addr addressing modes. And we specifically tailored this address ALU um, for those uh, addressing modes, such that um, it can it can basically calculate any of those uh, index addressing modes in one microcycle, um, and then the indirect modes will take two mic microcycles. Uh, the other thing to note here is the data memory controller. Uh, so this basically acts as an, another pipeline stage, uh, if you will. So the execute stage can basically say read data and move on to the, to the next uh, micro op and the data memory controller will take care of the rest. All right, so now that we've uh, gone over the micro architecture and done a little review, let's look at some of the updates that we did this semester. The first thing I wanna point out is a new uh, block that sits inside the data LU. Uh, we call it the sequential arithmetic unit. And uh, this implements the uh, standard 6009 uh, 8 by 8 bit uh, multiply, as well as the uh, BCD correction instruction. And the reason I put this in here was because I wanted to isolate it from the uh, major timing path by doing by building it, its its own uh, its own block and putting registers on the inputs and outputs. I can basically uh, isolate that timing path, and it uh, can can be a well a well con controlled timing path that doesn't uh, become the the uh, worst case. And on top of that, I can parameterize all these instructions. So now the user can select what uh, it instructions they actually want to implement. I'm sure most of them will throw out the BCD correction, <laughs> but uh, uh, but you can also choose uh, some of the new in instructions that I've taken from the. Um, HC11 and HC12 uh, ISA, and these include uh, 16 by 16 uh, with a 32-bit result multiplies, as well as uh, 32 by 16 uh, divides, signed and unsigned. But that's not that's not all you can implement here. I mean, there's other uh, type of algorithms that fit uh, very well within this architecture. Um, there's uh, several quartic algorithms where you can calculate, uh, uh, you know, co cosine and sine, as well as a square square root. But again, all this can be parameterized, so it doesn't uh, affect the overall area if I add these in, in instructions because, you know, you can basically just parameterize them out and reduce your area to make your, your uh, processor IP very small, or you can have these, these functions to make it a little bit more powerful for DSP or control applications. All right, so let's look at uh, another update that we made. I already mentioned that uh, the Turbo 9 uses the uh, 6009 instruction set, which has 16-bit instructions. Um, and that the internal data path is 16 bits. So we went ahead and uh, uh, made the data bus itself, the internal data bus 16 bits, and the internal program bus 16 bits, and the external data bus we also uh, made 16 bits. But we made this so that, such that you can um, change out the wishbone controller. So all you need to do is change out this block itself, and you can have an 8-bit external data bus or 16-bit data bus. Um, so the surprise is, is that the Turbo 9 is now a true 16-bit uh, microprocessor, and uh, along with the sequential arithmetic unit, it has uh, new powerful 16 and 32-bit multiply and divide instructions. So uh, you know it's it's a lot more than just a regular 6809. It's now you know a true 16-bit processor. All right, so let's take a closer look at the uh, memory bus architecture of the Turbo 9. Of course, it's always been uh, a pipeline wishbone uh, compatible bus, um, but now we have uh, some some options. You can have three different versions of the uh, Turbo 9. Uh, you can have the uh, regular tur Turbo 9, which of course has the uh, all of them have the 16-bit uh, internal data paths, but the difference would be that the regular Turbo 9 has the 8-bit external bus, so 16-bit transactions would take two cycles. Uh, you can have the Turbo 9 S, which has an external 16-bit uh, data, data bus that relies on aligned uh, words. So one cycle for a aligned 16-bit transaction and two cycles for an unaligned 16-bit transaction. Or you can have the uh, racing version, which is the Turbo 9R. Uh, and that has a 16-bit uh, external data bus and all 16-bit transactions are, um, are one cycle. And then on the left here, uh, shows a little bit more detail on how you would set up the uh, pipeline wishbone bus. Um, and I want to point out that as it's drawn here, uh, it has a latency of four, right? So 
the, uh, the, the outputs of the turbine are registered. And then you have one, two, three, uh, four cycles of latency. But the other uh, update that we've been working on is that we've made the wishbone controller have automatic latency adjustment. So uh, this is a tool that we're giving to the de designer um, to make better de decisions with regard to timing. So, you know, if you're building a, uh, a uh, memory subsystem and you, your decode logic starts to become the worst timing path, uh, you're going to slow down the entire system because you can only run, um, you know, the clock as fast as the worst timing path. So by giving uh, the designer options to add, to either add more uh, pipeline registers to the uh, memory subsystem, he can reduce that, uh, that worst timing path down. But if he has a memory subsystem that doesn't require <clears throat> complex decode logic, he can take advantage of the higher efficiency. Um, and the wishbone controller will actually take care of that. So, I mean, you can uh, reduce, you can actually parameterize out those output uh, registers on the wishbone controller. Uh, you can even eliminate these registers and run uh, the uh, synchronous memory on the opposite edge to have a latency of one. So, and all this is, is completely automatic um, and uh, the, the uh, wishbone controller just figures it out. A full verification test bench is expected from commercial level microprocessor IV, IP vendors such as ARM. And this is really what separates professional level IP from amateur projects. In our case, we have a test bench that's set up with the Turbo 9 RTL and a behavioral model. And uh, how it works is we, we build a memory with all the randomization and instructions necessary for each test. And then we issue it to both the Turbo 9 and the behavioral model. And then we can pair the memory on, on the output side. Um, so we have this set up to run a nightly regression. So every 24 hours, uh, we'll run uh, a suite of tests. There are over 4,500 attributes. It's self-testing. There's full ISA coverage. Um, it fully randomizes all the inputs. Currently, there are 34 separate test cases that run, and there's 100 randomizations per test. Yeah, this is uh, a big deal. I mean, um, if you're a company that's considering, you know, using a, like an ARM Cortex M0 uh, versus the Turbo 9, uh, this is the proof that basically says that the Turbo 9 is the silicon ready. They can basically take this this test bench and run it themselves um, and show that, you know, the entire I ISA is, is uh, covered. You know, this is something that is not common you know, on the uh, IP, open, open source IP. So this is the verification attribute summary. And as you can see, there's over 99% of all attributes covered. And the number of attributes is largely a product of the addressing mode, all the instructions that use the addressing mode, and then all the permutations, combinations, and randomization of these instruction addressing modes. And so we cover the bulk of these, but there are a few exceptions that remain, which are the jump instructions, stack instructions, and software and hardware interrupts. Benchmarking is a critical way of measuring the performance of the microprocessor. And for the Turbo 9 project, we decided to take two popular benchmarks and use them for measuring. The first one is in dry stone. It's a C program that has been around for quite a while. It's a synthetic computing benchmark developed in 1984. It's representative of integer programming on a microprocessor. It does not test floating point but it does exercise multiplication and division, which we thought was perfect for the Turbo 9's new multiplication and division instructions. It also is a measurement of compiler performance, and we're using DMIPS, a common CPU performance metric, for expressing our results. The second benchmark program that we chose was ByteSiv. There's an implementation in the 1981 issue of Byte Magazine. This is actually a prime number search algorithm based on the sieve of Eratosthenes. It's a good benchmark for exercising memory addressing modes, which the Turbo 9 and the 69 have plenty of. The third benchmark we chose was the byte sieve again, but this time we implemented it in a similar language. We did that for several reasons. We wanted to optimize the benchmark very tightly. We wanted to remove the compiler dependency, use it for an extra data point, and we found that 
this particular benchmark was ideal for coding and handwritten assembly because it's a small, easy to grasp algorithm. It wasn't very complex like dry stone. When looking at the C benchmarks for dry stone and byte sieve, we had to survey the existing family of C compilers for the 6809. We started out with GCC, which is a longstanding C compiler with impressive 6809 optimizations. Obviously, GCC is a uh, compiler that's been around for a long time and has a 6809 branch. And we found that despite it working very well for the Turbo 9, it was not actively supported. So we began looking at other options. We started out next with CMOC. This is a more recent C compiler that hasn't been around that long, but specifically targets the 6809. It's used a lot in the color computer community and actively supported by its author, Mr. Pierre Sarrazin. The third compiler we looked at is BBCC. This is a, an interesting compiler. It's supported uh, by multiple platforms and has multiple processor support as well, 6809 included, obviously. Dr. Volker Barthelman is the author, and we found him to be very receptive to requests that we had when it came to querying about how the compiler worked, as well as adding some additional features that we'll talk about. And it actually provided the best optimization in our test that is both optimized for size and for speed. So we have found a winner in VBCC. So let's talk a little bit more about the VBC compiler. Um, so Dr. Bartherman has been very re responsive uh, and helpful. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the Turbo 9 has some new instructions, the multiply and divide instructions. Uh, and we were implementing these, uh, testing them out by doing inline assembly in the uh, C code. But after talking to Dr. Uh, Bartherman, he offered to make a target specific version of the BCC for us. So now the Turbo 9 has its own uh, C, C compiler that supports these uh, these uh, instruction uh, extensions. And this is huge. Uh, but more importantly, uh, is is having someone like Dr. Partherman um, being, being able to talk to the person that's writing the compiler. Uh, and why is this? Well, you know, I'm interested in building the fastest and most efficient possible microarchitecture. Uh, I'm very very wary of making changes to the ISA beyond what the standard 6009 ISA is. Because if I go adding any instruction, it's just going to add to the area and power of the Turbo 9, which is uh, exactly the opposite of what we're trying to achieve with our uh, target application. Um, but if I can talk to the, the author of the compiler and discuss you know, what targeted instructions can, uh, can greatly help performance, then uh, that's just a huge asset, asset to our team. Um, so yeah, so there are a, a couple uh, instructions that we're, that we're talking about, but we're gonna be very careful about what we, about what we add. Um, and it's very exciting to have uh, someone like him um, and his expertise um, to help out with our project. We've looked at dry stone with regards to performance. Now we want to look at it with regards to size. Since we are trying to compile consistently across our tests, we have kept the performance option in play with the compiler results that you see on the right. So why is code size important? Well, it's important because reducing code size means reducing memory, which means when you put this in silicon, it reduces the die area and reduces, of course, the power leakage. So becoming smaller is important, but smaller doesn't necessarily mean faster. So again, we're focused only at looking at code size, even though we're compiling for performance. The results are quite impressive for the Turbo 9. We looked across all of the different compilers for the Turbo 9 that supported the Turbo 9. We looked at GCC, CMOC, VBCC with the 6809 compilation turned on, and VBCC with the specific Turbo 9 compilation option turned on. And we beat all of those. 
The smallest size that we get is 4628 bytes, and that's with an optimization of 2 for the Turbo 9 using VBCC. What's even more impressive is that we beat the AVR and we beat the RISC 5. We beat the RISC 5, which is 94% larger by quite a bit. The AVR is 5.4% 5 5 larger, and we beat that as well. So what are the conclusions to draw? Well, the combination of the VBCC compiler with the Turbo 9 beats the competition, that is the AVR and the RISC 5. And that is only possible because of the great compiler support that we get through VBCC. And of course, VBCC offers many options for size and performance. So there's a lot of other tweaks that we can do here if we want to really investigate this further. All right, so let's take a quick look again at the uh, dry stone performance. Now let's also include the uh, 8-bit uh, Turbo 9 option. Um, again, obviously the Turbo 9 R, uh, which now you know what that is, uh, gives the best uh, DMIPS uh, per megahertz result. Uh, that's 33% faster than the Pico RV32 and 68% faster than the AVR. The Turbo 9 8-bit uh, gives a impressive performance here. It's uh, just slightly edges out the um, the Atmel AVR, um, but that's with an 8-bit bus. So remember, the AVR has a 24-bit uh, memory bandwidth, and the Pico RV has a 32-bit memory bandwidth. So the fact that uh, a little uh, microprocessor with just an 8-bit bus can achieve this level of performance is very impressive. And having that 8-bit bus will also reduce the area quite a bit of all the decode lo logic that's not necessary. Uh, lastly, uh, looking at the uh, frequency uh, in an uh, equal platform, so given that it's the same FPGA with the same speed grade, um, the Turbo 9 R is 11% uh, faster than the uh, Pico RV32. Now, an interesting metric here is that if you compare it to the original implementation of the 69, 6809 instruction set, um, it is uh, quite a bit faster. So 112 megahertz Turbo 9 R is the equivalent of a 337 megahertz uh, Motorola 6809. Um, so that kind of puts it in perspective that this isn't just a, another 6809 clone. Um, this is a, a brand new microarchitecture and we're taking the best aspects of the 6809, its instruction set, um, and we're building a microarchitecture uh, to be used um, in future silicon. We looked at code size for dry stone, and now let's take a look at code size for byte sim and C. Again, we're looking at the three C compilers for the 6809 and Turbo 9, that's GCC, CMOC, and VBCC. And across those three compilers, VBCC gives us the best code size. We have a very good reduction from CMOC and a very strong reduction from GCC. But let's take a look at how we stack against the other processors. For AVR, we are 23% smaller when we combine the VBCC compiler with Turbo 9. And we're 91% smaller than the RISC-V. So the conclusion, the Turbo 9 and the VBCC compiler give us awesome code size. Now let's take a look at BytesIv, the assembly version. So we're taking the compiler out of the equation here and simply looking at code size when it comes to writing the best assembly language possible. We're going to look at the Turbo 9 versus the AVR and the RISC. Now, when we set up this test, I advocated for writing Risk 5 and AVR assembly for the byte sieve algorithm, and Kevin advocated for the Turbo 9. So we both try to write the best possible code for those processors, respectively. We also looked at each other's code at the end to make sure that we were optimizing fairly. And with this in mind, the Turbo 9 assembly language version of byte sieve beats the AVR by 18% and the Risk 5 by 20%. The conclusion? Handwritten assembly allows us to get a more finely tuned size measurement, and the Turbo 9 wins. We've looked at byte sieve in terms of code size. Now let's take a look at it in terms of performance on the Turbo 9 versus the competitor. Now we're going to look at both C and assembly performance, to be fair. 
In the case of C, the AVR does beat the Turbo 9 in speed by about 30%. But when we look at hand-coded assembly, the Turbo 9 beats the AVR by 13%. So what is the conclusion? Well, the AVR GCC compiler is a worthy competitor. And it's a good example of how compiler optimizations can have a large impact on performance. But in hand-coded assembly, which is always usually the best, the Turbo 9 wins. And there actually could be some opportunities here to improve VBCC optimization based on the hand-coded assembly that we did. Our project includes several professional level tools available to help in the development of software for the Turbo 9. We've already covered two of these in previous slides, that being the 6809 behavioral simulation and the Turbo 9 RTL simulation. The 6809 behavioral simulation is cycle accurate to the MC6809 and includes the Turbo 9 extensions. The Turbo 9 RTL simulation is a complete cycle by cycle Turbo 9 design that includes all the SSC level components. Both of these are central to the verification bench and can generate wave dumps as well as console output offering detailed debugging capabilities. We also have Sim 6809, which is an open source 6809 software simulator written in C that includes the Turbo 9 extensions. And finally, we have the Turbo 9 ASIC or FPGA, which is the synthesized Turbo 9 core running on chip that includes an S19 bootloader. All right, so let's take a quick look at the uh, IP development toolkit. Uh, these are the tools you would use for uh, uh, developing your Ver Verilog code and uh, your hardware. Um, so we were using Cadence tools, uh, but we switched to open source tools. Uh, this is because we can't always rely on having the expensive licenses provided by UF. And using open source tools is always a good a good idea because it's free for everybody. Uh, the tool we, we selected was Icarus Verilog, and it's a Verilog 2001 simulator, which means that we had to convert all of our system Verilog to Verilog 2001. Now, this does have the benefit of being more portable. There's uh, several synthesis tools that I know of that only support Verilog 2001. All of our uh, run and regression scripts are also built around iVerilog. Um, also, we provide the microcode assembler that uh, Mike wrote. Um, it's an excellent uh, macro-based custom assembler, and with this, you can uh, add new instructions to, to the Turbo 9. It's very, very powerful. Um, and then we use the GTK Wave uh, as our waveform viewer, and we use, uh, we're currently using Xilinx tools for FPGA um, synthesis, though note that our IP is target independent. Um, you know, we're targeting uh, an, a an ASIC application as well. Um, and in the future, uh, we will be using Yosis uh, for uh, standard cell library synthesis. So to summarize, we have completed the following. We have a microarchitecture and a microcode that is mature. We've vetted that microarchitecture with multiple C compilers. We have a verification test bench that is almost 100% complete in terms of coverage. The Turbo 9's level of performance compared to its competition is excellent. And the benchmarks confirm the expected performance of the Turbo 9 architecture. For next steps, uh, we're going to look at some further microarchitecture optimizations. One of them is branch prediction. So you can expect even more performance out of the Turbo 9. Uh, we're going to measure area with uh, using YOSIS and a standard cell library. And we're also going to measure area of uh, RISC-V and ARM and uh, gain some more uh, data on our competitors for comparison. So in conclusion, the Turbo 9 is the microprocessor solution for compact, high-performance application where size and efficiency matter. We've got a few acknowledgments we'd like to make. Um, First is the late Dr. Lynch. He was my professor, and I credit him with uh, lighting that initial spark, uh, which got me interested in microprocessor design. We'd also like to acknowledge Joel Boney and Terry Ritter. They were the co-architects of the original M M6809 ISA, and uh, we believe they wrote a very excellent instruction set that we use for the Turbo 9. We'd also like to acknowledge the Tandy Color Computer community, composed of energetic retro computer enthusiasts. We'd like to call out William Astle, Pierre Sarrazin, Red Gordon, the Coco Crew Podcast, and many others in the community. They continue to develop new 6809 tools, compilers, and assemblers, and 
This community also maintains important 6809 system software like OS9 and Fusix. Turbo 9, a modern implementation of a classic instruction set. Thanks for watching.